Our first storyteller of the day is Peter Eckersall. And um, on the back of your program, you will see that there are bios for everybody. So um, Peter Eckersall is a professor and executive officer of our PhD program in theater and performance. And he will be talking with you about partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for organizing such a wonderful event. Um, uh, as Edith said, I'm Peter Eckersall, and I'm uh, the executive officer of the PhD program in theater here. Uh, I also come from Australia, where I worked for many years in the University of Melbourne, and uh, in an environment where we're, I think, much more attenuated to the need to get grants, because uh, we are always told if you want to get promoted, if you want to run projects, if you want to develop research and publish and put together teams, you need to be applying to organizations like the Australian Research Council or uh, the Australia Council for the Arts or other uh, public or private institutions that fund research. And um, I guess the reason why I'm talking to you today is because there is an international context here in that uh, as a, a faculty member of the City University of New York, I still apply to the ARC as an international investigator. And so, um, and there's great need for people who are running projects for, that are funded through organizations like the Australian Research Council or the British uh, Research Infrastructure or the Canadian Research Council or the Japan Foundation or several other organizations that I'm regularly knocking on the door of to ask for money uh, to have an international team of investigators. So this is a story about a partnership. It's a story about um, the way in which we put together a team of researchers from uh, an international field and it's also a story about uh, a research project that works across more traditional uh, research outputs such as writing books and having conferences and also producing some kinds of um, artistic research, uh, uh, so-called practice-led research in, uh, along the way. Um, the slides that you're seeing broadly describe some of the parameters of this research project which uh, is around the theme of new media dramaturgy. So uh, a group of researchers working in the field of performance studies, uh, myself as also somebody who works as a professional dramaturg, came together to talk about the need to uh, develop a research project around the, the question of what happens to the, to the situation of live performance when it becomes so intensely mediatized. So even if you go to a relatively small theater today, and theatre is always emphasising its liveness and its ephemerality and its direct relationship with the audience. When you go to even a small theatre, you're actually in a very uh, mediatised space now, whether you're talking about the very sophisticated use of lighting or the, the way they're using sound, for example, or increasingly, it's just simply the effects that are created through uh, that manipulation of the stage. Uh, introducing various areas, uh, uh, effects like mixing smoke with light and sound to create really immersive and transforming experiences for an audience. And so we were really wanting to examine this question. What happens on a material level to the production of theatre when we introduce a, a very strong and, and transforming uh, discourse around media? Projections, sound, light, and also atmospheric elements. Um, and so we coined the phrase new media dramaturgy to describe this. And then we initially put together a team that comprised three scholars working in Australia and one in Holland and one in Croatia. And we, before we went for a, 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 national, uh, a nationally assessed grant, we did a year's work. And we basically, we produced a panel and went to a conference and we did a little publication out of that. And so we said, okay, there's a viable topic here. There's a question that needs to be asked. We've got an international team of people who are approaching this perspective, uh, this question from different perspectives. Um, and we can now demonstrate that we're a team that haven't just come together in a kind of, you know, happy coincidence that there happens to be a ground round coming around, uh, but we actually have a track record of working together. We've done a conference presentation and we've done publication and we're thinking productively together to, uh, about this project from this kind of very multi-perspectile, almost circular kind of relationship to the key questions. 
So the first thing that's really important in establishing these grants is to get together a team and establish a track record. And then you start to work out what the value of that team is, who has particular areas of expertise, who has particular fascinations, who has particular contacts that can bring more people into the grant. Uh, then we uh, were successful in an, uh, a round with the Australian Research Council and we, over three years, we got a grant for something like uh, $350,000 Australian. It's about $300,000 US. And so we had a team of five researchers. Suddenly we brought two researchers onto the grant and so they worked for the grant to help us produce the research. They became our research assistants and typically those people were, well one of them was a PhD student and one of them was a recently graduated PhD who was uh, between finishing their degree and, and taking on a full-time job. So they became a research assistant for us and they worked pretty much full-time for two years on the grant. Um, we started by having meetings. We're an international group and then uh, confusing matters even more, halfway through the grant I got a job here and I, I moved to the United States. So uh, we had three international investigators uh, and then only two home-based ones uh, back in Australia. Um, we of course produced a number of different research outputs. We were always aiming to do that and we articulated that in, a, in our grant application. Uh, one of those was to produce a, a monograph, which uh, you can see the image of up there on the, on the slides, the New Media Dramaturgy book. Another one was a project that uh, you know, my background is in Japanese studies and so I did a project with colleagues in Japan to historicize the, the whole paradigm of new media through this very important Japanese group called Dumtype who were active in the 1980s and 1990s. And in some ways the instigation for this project was an experience I had in 1993 when I'd come back from uh, doing my research from towards my PhD in Japan and I was sent to the Adelaide Arts Festival to interview Dumtype who were installing a new show for the national broadcaster. And I walked into the theatre and I, I was I initially trained in, as an actor and I've been in a lot of theatres and I walked into a theatre and it's the first time I saw laptops in a theatre space and there were a bunch of young tech heads programming the computer or the video feeds for this performance. This is 1993, it's still very early days for projection and new media, but it was a kind of moment, a paradigm, a, you know, a paradigmatic shift. Suddenly there's a laptop in a theatre space um, and that's a radical transformation uh, for the theatre because it means that the theatre moves out of a kind of analogue, live, fuzzy kind of thing where people are moving switches by hand into a, a, a pre-programmed digital experience. And of course now that technology has just you know, become so intensified that what we can do in theatre now and the expectations that audiences have for a live experience are so far um, uh, uh, advanced from what we were able to do, say, when I went to drama school in the late 1970s. Um, so we produced a study around this very important uh, group, Dumb Type, who, and we interviewed them and we, 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 often, we did a lot of work talking to the people who built the technology uh, for this company because they, as they said, well, when we started working, the only, uh, we had to make a data projector talk to a computer and the only way we could do that was to hotwire the printer port because the only output out of a computer was a printer port. And so, of course, these you know, young tech heads, they were able to do this. This was really fascinating research and so part of that book was investigating the technological shift. We also, through my work with a Belgian artist named Chris Verdonk, uh, who's a new media performance artist and a very distinguished and important one, um, brought him into the project and through uh, working with a, a, a presenter organisation called Performance Space, we brought him to Sydney and we, we, we displayed one of his works, which is periodically coming up, uh, in a, 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 media, a media work, we didn't uh, have the money to produce a live work, but we produced one of his media works and exhibited it in the performance space in Sydney and around which we had a conference that brought together the uh, academics and scholars working on this project with a, with a group of artists who were new media artists who were in, working in theatre to introduce new kind of technologies and new practices. So. So a third outcome was this conversation between uh, academics and practitioners. 
That then meant that we were able to approach performance space to help assist in bringing Chris Vadonk out. It also meant we could go to the Australia Council and we were able to get a small amount of money. The Australia Council is the national peak body for funding the arts in Australia. And of course, this funding is always shrinking, but it's still possible to... And all of these organisations, when you go to them and say, well, we're working with a partnership, their eyes light up and they say, well, that's what we're looking for. So if, you know, because if they don't have to pay for the whole project and they can justify to their uh, uh, peak bodies that they're actually working in an interdisciplinary way and putting together teams, they're very, very happy. Three minutes to go. So I moved here and then we did the project, we did the monograph, we did the edited volume, we did the workshop, we did the exhibition of the artist and then I moved here and I thought, well, how can I bring some of that conversation to the United States where, and I had to learn about a completely different research culture, you know, where there's not a, a national peak body that's going to give you 35, you know, $350,000 to do a project in the humanities or the creative arts. Um, and so we began, I began a series of conversations and then there was a CUNY PSC grant um, that was really about putting together um, uh, um, professors who were experienced with, uh, with early career researchers and junior faculty. And one of our graduates from our PhD program named Bertie Ferdman teaches theatre and performance studies down at BMCC. And together we had this conversation, this shared uh, conversation around the kind of outcomes of NMD, which is really about a new relationship between performance and visual arts. And she was across that area and I was working across that area. So we, we extended out of the original grant and we put together a new proposal, which was precisely to talk about the relationship between dramaturgy and curatorship and what happens when theatre becomes much more concerned with this kind of visual presence when it starts to occupy the framework that was traditionally occupied by the visual arts. So we start talking about performance and its visuality. And so that project, which we were successfully funded, uh, enabled us to basically have a lot of conversations with people who are programming performance in visual arts institutions and people who are programming festivals who are bringing this question of visuality into the, the, the conversation of their programming. And so th this particular research project is, is still underway, but we'll be producing uh, a book that has a series of interviews with, with a great many different really fascinating and extraordinary people who are working in this field. So the summary is build your networks, always think sideways out of the original project, establish a team and establish a track record for that team. Don't expect to get funded just because, you know, you can see an idea and you bring together three people suddenly and you produce, oh, we've been a team for two minutes. Nobody's going to fund that. Um, uh, do some publishing, do some outputs, do some little conferences or something. Put together your team, do the big application. If you don't get it the first time, put it in a game. Um, you know, there's an expectation in these big grant systems that you'll come back next time, that you'll take, take the disappointment on the chin, that you'll take their advice into account and you'll come back next time. And then always look for opportunities that you can move sideways and, and think about the international context because there, there are many, many grant uh, schemes that actually really, uh, the, the researchers in those, in those countries are really looking for good international scholars to join their teams because it makes their grants more fundable. You can say, oh, we've got international relationships, so thank you. Mm.